thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure uh, and a privilege as well to chat to you, mate. Who's um, got the best backdrop? That's. <laughs> <laughs> it does look a little bit corporate, doesn't it? I mean, even wearing the top as well. So, yeah, no, I've, what, I've, I've, I've been told about what you're doing, and that's obviously what we part of what we're going to talk about. And it sounds amazing. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm all, I'm all, all up for giving people the military experience without sending them to war because I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for peace these days in my old age. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah, incredible, incredible. Yeah. So, yes, what is the SF experience? Well, it's, it started off back in um, 2013. Um, tragically, three guys died in the Brecon Beacons um, on, on reserve, SAS reserve selection. Um, we, there was a lot of uh, news coverage at the time. It all went quite political about the reasons and um, one of the uh, one of the guy's fathers, um, he was he was uh, I, I I knew him briefly, and I felt I felt sorry for the parents because all this political stuff was going you know going on in the press, in the media, um, and there was little compassion for these for these for the parents, and I felt like I wanted to do something for them and put a memorial event on for them. Um, I looked into it, gathered a few of my colleagues, and yeah, that's exactly what we did. We put out um, on Facebook, on a Facebook page, um, an announcement of what we, you know, this memorial event we were going to do, and we were going to do it over the fan dance routes, the SAS fan dance routes in the Brecon Beacons. So yeah, here's me thinking I was just going to have about 10 people, 10 of my mates or something, walking around. It gathered pace, um, there was hundreds and hundreds of people joining the Facebook group. Um, yeah, and, and, and a lot of local people outside of Bre at the Beacons, people from all, all over the country wanted to get involved when you heard about what we were doing. Uh, before I knew it, um, yeah, there was hundreds of people um, took part on, on the memorial event. I didn't actually end up walking it myself because of um, the huge numbers that joined, so I had to, I had to suddenly take a management role. Um, and that, that, become, that become really difficult for me because I'd never, you know, I was fresh, you know, I've never been involved with events and commercial type events. Um, so yeah, I needed a lot of help, got a lot of guys involved. Um, and yeah, we, it, it went ahead really successfully. Um, and at the end, uh, we raised um, close to 5K for the charity as well, which was amazing, ama amazing gestures by people who were uh, putting money in the, in the pot for that. Um, off the back of that, I've had a lot of calls, a lot of emails uh, with thanks and appreciate, appreciation. And, and then incoming started a lot of emails about, you know, can, can I put something else on, but for, you know, better circumstances, happier circumstances. Um, I totally played that down, didn't want to know because it was, took a lot of stress out of me, you know, at the time. And I thought it's not something I want to get into. Later though, the, it just come back to me, the buzz of it all, and I wanted, I thought, well, why not? Let me try it. Uh, that's where the SF experience was born. Um, it, it, it just shot off. Um, I, I started with a fan dance event. I just basically mimicked the actual, um, uh, the route march of, of selection. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it was quite, it was, it was, it was amazing the numbers that joined us for that first one. And yeah, it just kicked off from there really. It's incredible what, what you've achieved, but I just want to um, backtrack a bit, Jace, because I know um, I'm conscious that we might lose people. So the event you mentioned was a very, almost like a freak occurrence where three individuals who were trying to pass selection, I don't think it matters, but was it for the regular SS or was it for the reserve? It was. This was for the reserves. Yeah. Um, saying that though, it was on test week. So nowadays, all units, all SF units, all take part in test week on the same week all, all together. So this this was, they were, um, you know, trying for the reserves, but there would have been regulars on the ground as well. It was an extremely hot day. Um, they wasn't the only guys to go down. Uh, there was three of them tragically who died, but there was a lot of um, a lot of people hospital hospitalised on that day as well. Um, this was taking part on the point to point route march, 
which is one of the longest and toughest route marches on test week of uh, SAS selection. Um, according to weather, the weather it was one of the hottest days um, in the area at the, at the time. Um, and yeah, these guys, there was it was all heat related uh, why they went down, but. Without going into too much of the politics, there, there was a, a lot of emphasis on the tracking system that they were, um, that they have on the bodies, uh, which went through um, various checks to, and, and yeah, the, um, it was found that they weren't fit for purpose at the time. Uh, I know a lot of that's changed now. Uh, back in the day, they didn't have trackers, but I think once you introduce technology like that, people start relying on it, and I think that was the downfall uh, for these guys. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's always going to be people who want to dissect these um, kind of incidents, but the SAS aren't stupid, you know. I'm sure they'll 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 take the information and they've dealt with it as you know as pragmatically and as 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 best they can. Um, just very unfortunate. So big respect to those three three men. Yeah, there was there was actually calls, and you could see you could be sympathised with the people that were calling for it. But there were calls to soften the selection procedure and to change it, um, but that that didn't happen. Selection is selection, and it has to be ruth ruthless and tough to select the right guys, um, you know, to to get in that unit and to get in any SF unit. Um, so instead, the 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 tracking system was looked at. Uh, I don't quite know the the outcome. Um, I'm not serving anymore, so I don't quite know the outcome, but I'm sure, as you said, the regiment and the SF and MOD as a, as a whole would have made some changes there, without doubt. Yeah. And so the fan dance, is, it's, um, that's something that's entered public parlance now, isn't it? Every, I think yeah. quite a lot of people know what it is, but do you want to just elucidate on that? Yeah, I mean, it's become world famous, actually. Um, Obviously, yeah, we've jumped on the, the name of the fan dance that the military have been using for over 50 years. Um, but that's mainly because we use the same route um, and, and we adopt that same route because it's a testing route and that's why it's used on selection. It's a brilliantly testing route psychologically as well because you halfway point, you're coming back on yourself and going across that tough terrain you've just been on. It attracts people from all over. Um, on our events, we, we get up to four to even 500 sometimes on, on the event. Um, you know, they'll pay the money to come and do it. And it used to be an old saying in the military, like, you know, people would come and pay to do this. And I'm actually seeing the other side of that now, where people actually do pay to, pay, pay to do it. But fair dues, because I think I would as well, because it's a testing environment. But what the, what the clutch of it is, is people want to see other people and compete against other people. Um, and I think long gone are the days when people just want to go to the gym and do the workout and go home. People want to actually take part in some outside, and yeah, and uh, you know, it's encapsulating in, in the human spirit of wanting to socialise at the same time as well. Mm -hmm. So it is all good, and, and yeah, it, it's attracting quite a lot of numbers. How does it rate then in terms of hardship compared to the actual? fan dance well do you want to explain what what the route is just so we've got an idea of mile mileage or kilometerage and yeah and well, well let's start it starts and finishes at the story arms um in brecon beacons it's just on the a470 trunk road um it then takes you up and over the, the actual fan that's where it gets its name from penny fan it's the highest um southern british uh, peak um uh, in, and yeah it's um it, the route initially takes you over the fan, down the other side, um, along the Roman road, through the woods, and there's a turnaround point. That's 12 kilometres to that point, and then it's literally turn around and back on yourself. The toughest part coming back up, infamously, is the uh, Jacob's Ladder. That's the, the other side of the penny fan. And after doing already doing that distance, probably up to about 20k by then, um, you then have to climb this Jacob's Ladder, which is notoriously tough uh, and that gets spoke about quite a lot and then you're back into the story arms average time is around four to five hours um the cutoff time on selection it, it, it's varied from what i know but it's around four hours 15 um but however going back to your original question the difference is um on selection uh, for S any sf unit um and by the way the regulars do this as like a pre-selection um 
um, kind of criteria, if you like. The reserves do it as part of the selection course, roughly around weekend six or seven, uh, known as high walk. Um, however, the actual way it's ran is exactly the same, uh, which slightly differs from our event. Our event, we let everyone go, and it's, it's, it's um, whatever time you get them come back in. Uh, we do have cutoff times. On selection, you'll have a DS at the front, and it's a DS-led march, and you're basically told, keep up with me or you fail. Um, and that, that's, that's it. It's as simple as that. So the DS have got a bit of a discretion who, who passes and who fails, but it is based on the time. The only crutch there is you don't know what that time is. So we try and we, we take the toughness of the event and stamp it with our own rules and regs to make it tough, but make it enjoyable at the same time. Because we don't want to fail people on our events. We want them to know they've done something really tough, but at the same time, um, you know, give them something they know they can pass if they work hard for it. Do you get, is there a set sort of weight that you suggest people or you ask people to carry or can that, can they, can they carry what they like? Yeah, we, we've, again, this is where it differs from selection because on selection you're carrying, depending on the, the unit you're in, you could be carrying 55 pounds plus your food, water and weapon. So on the events, uh, we're not as cruel as that because again, we're trying to, make it tough but not impossible so we allow for different categories so we have um, a load bearing category of 35 pound on the back and we have a clean fatigue cat category where there's no minimum uh, no minimum uh, weight requirements and we also have a load stone category where these guys are carrying 45 pound and a mock weapon it's basically a scaffold pole that weighs about six pound um, so that gives that's that's for guys that really want to test themselves closer to the edge um, so that you can see there's something there for, for everyone. Do many of those guys then doing the, the full Monty, so to speak, you know, do they, do they pass it in, in, the, in the time? Yeah, there's, there's quite a lot. The guys that really do the, the, the full shebang, the 45 pound with a mock weapon, most of them do pass because it's the type of person that are applying for that, that are the type that are really going for it. We get a lot of guys actually that are, um, a fair few guys that are actually going for selection who may message me on the side and say, you know, Jace, I'm, I'm training for this, that and the other. Um, can you, you know, give us a few ideas of what I need to be doing and, and, and is this a good test? So we get guys like that as well that want to really test themselves to see if they've got what it takes for when they do it for real. And, that, and that's great. That gives me a sense of achievement that I'm, I'm actually doing something for these guys as well, you know, putting something back into the system, if you like. Wow. Have you got plans to expand this experience to anything outside of the fan dance well yeah it already has i mean if anyone um drops a, an eye onto our website you'll see we've got we, we we run now not only the fan dance we run different variants of the fan dance so we've got something called fan dance hunted where it's a little bit of a take and a twist on what happens to inject a bit of adrenaline in there so what we do on there, we release everyone in their categories on the fan dance. And then 20 minutes later, our hunter force comes after you. And you've got, you've got uh, armbands on, like you see on these SAS programs, they've got armbands on. The idea is we've got a team of what we call wolves. And the wolves will chase the registrants, the runners, if they catch up, take their armbands off them. And that indicates that they've been caught. The guys still carry on because we, we then offer two different types of medals, one for a survivor who's evaded the wolves, if you like, and one for a finisher who's got caught but has still finished the route. So it's, again, it's a take on the old SAS route march, but we've twisted it because this is, you know, we're looking at, at the same time on the commercial side what people actually want, and that's become quite a big hit as well. Uh, we've also, we've got all kinds of events now. We've gone into boot camps, we've got international events, We've got a desert survival course in Nevada and in Arizona. Um, we, we've got all kinds, but they're all based on an, a military kind of uh, emphasis where we're giving people the true adventure of the military, but as you and I know, chopping out all the, all the bad bits uh, that, we, that you know, we've, we've had to endure through our time. Mm. Um, so we're giving people a bit of a taste of, of, of the you military. Chopping out the 99.5% of the bad bits. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, you know the you know the paint and the vehicles and the brushing the leaves and the stacking on. Yeah. yeah. There's always chairs that need shifting. Yeah. <laughs> um so so tell me, I'm just trying to get a, you know, in in my kind of uh, Tarzan head, an idea of the total distance. <clears throat> Um, and the sort I know I know it kind of doesn't really matter when you're going up and downhill, but what what is the total distance and, and what time? I, if you don't want to say the time because it's you know not told to the to the competitors, that's fine. But what sort of time do they come in and what sort of distance they have to cover? Is this for the fan dance? Yeah, yeah. The the fan, the total distance of the fan dance then is twenty four kilometers. Okay. Um, it's, that's just shy of 15 miles, I believe. So um, that's the total distance. So it's 12k out, 12k back. We don't give them an overall cutoff time. Um, we give them a halfway cutoff time because it's pointless giving them a total cutoff time because when they come in late, well, you know what we're going to do. So we we like to put a preventative time in there uh, to kick people up the arse a little bit. So they've got to get into that halfway point by a time. Now that does vary. I couldn't even tell you the time now because it varies and we look at the weather and the ground conditions before we release that time. Um, if we were to give the same time summer and winter, that'd be a little bit unfair. So we do look at the ground conditions on the day and then we announce that cutoff time actually on the day of the event, the morning brief. We give a full brief in the morning, safety brief. Uh, we have um, guys that we bring in as well that are you know, a little bit more well-known, like Rusty Furman. Lofty Wiseman, Colin McLaughlin, people like this who people know, and they'll stand there with me and give a little chat in the morning, a little motivational chat, and they'll also hand the medals out at the end, uh, just to put a little face, a little shine on what we do. Um, but yeah, the total distance, 24K, cutoff time, I'd say on average, it's around three hours to the halfway point. We give them that, and all that is is a little bit of a deterrent to stop people having a picnic halfway because we did have that when we were when we initially started doing these events so we need to put something in place you know to keep it competitive most people get through we have got a safety vehicle a couple of safety vehicles at a halfway point with medics as well and so if someone's bitten off a little bit more they can chew you can get in the minibus and, and come back around so it's all good brilliant it's interesting isn't it because you could br Here's the thing, what you're doing at the moment comes under the kind of, let's call it the insurance parameters of, of say, if I entered a marathon, right? You know, I sign my name, that's it. If anything happens to me, it's kind of my own doing, right? Isn't it? Because I'm thinking you, if you were to branch the escape and evasion into the capture and interrogation, then then you're getting on quite it's dodgy ground isn't it when you're yeah. when you playing with people's mental state yeah we do um yeah we've got some really good insurance policies as you can imagine um you know we're two two sides here legally we've got really good insurance but as a duty of care we don't want to we want a, a safety net as well for the guys that come on board you know we generally do care about the guys that are coming on we want to deliver an enjoyable but tough and robust kind of set of events um, that set the benchmark. But we are very careful of not overstepping that mark. It's not selection at the end of the day. Um, we do have, as I say, different categories that you can move up from depending on your background and what you want from it. Um, but going back to what you said with the, um, the SEER phase, the escape and evasion and things like that, we do an event called Lodestone Continuation. We do host that on a yearly basis, and that's um, a week, a week long. Um, we use um, a, um, some service partners of ours um, that provide the location, and these guys jump parachute in and everything. It's they get para trained initially on the on the course, and the first thing they do is jump into the environment, and then uh, we take them through various um, you know exciting and adrenaline fueled. Um, programs on, on the course for example invasive driving is one of them range work that we're all used to and we take for granted but some guys have never done this so it's an introduction weapon handling so they get to play with a lot of weapons even though that you know they're not firing them at that point we do survival we bring in survival guys well-known survival guys like, like lofty wiseman like um, some of the b 
people from the military that are well trained and versed in survival. We bring them in and they get a good survival lesson. Um, and we do, as part of that, have a survival and escape and evasion part of that as well. The guys have trackers, so that's our base net. If, if things do go wrong, at least you know we can pull the plug and get these guys back. Mm -hmm. um, we've never had to do that. We've got a 100% safety record, and that's because of the hard work all the guys do to ensure safety. But that is a really fun, as I say, adrenaline-fueled um, course that we, we put out there, and it's attracted guys from overseas. Again, a few messages we've had, oh, I'm doing selection, oh, I'm doing this, doing that. Can, I have, can we have a go at this? So, yeah, it's, um, it, it's one of our better and, and fun events. It does, from, from our point of view, from a staff point of view, it takes a lot out of us, though, to deliver. But it's fun. It's fun for, for us as well. It's, hey, it's fun just, uh, just listening to it. So yeah. if, I, um, if I grab my producer and we rock up with our cameras, can, do you think yeah. I, I should have a go at this? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. The, the, you know, we have... Um, We've created our own videos for it as well to uh, encapsulate exactly what we do. So, you know, it's on, they're on the website to see. Um, and, you know, you, yeah, we encourage you if you want to come and, and, and do something with that. I say we put it on, on a yearly basis. Um, and it's great. It's, it's great. I wish I was on the other side of the fence sometimes to actually take part rather than hosting it. We do try and change it um, on a yearly basis. So it's... We do get guys, uh, you know, we get a good retention rate of guys wanting to come back and do it again. So we, we change it for that for that reason, mix it around a little bit, add new things, take a few things away that we thought didn't quite work last time. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely something in it for everyone there. Brilliant. And, Jace, you come from a special forces background, which obviously, you know, you, that brings a lot to, you, to your experience in itself. Can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually from a communications background within the SF environment. So I served in a unit known as 264 SAS Signal Squadron. Um, these guys, this unit, it's attached to 22 SAS. Um, yeah, they're, they're highly trained in what they do. They have to be because they're working alongside the counterparts of, of the SAS. So they have to be fully trained, they're fully airborne, 100% um, um, airborne unit. Um, and yeah, they go through a very similar aptitude phase, which is the hills phase. They, they, they do five weeks on the hills. Um, and then they go through um, military, um, SF military training. Um, um, they, they, then they take on their own, uh, after the aptitude phase, they take on their own uh, continuation phase, which is based on close support communications uh, for SF environments. That's, that's the role of someone in 264. Um, and then, yeah, they go off and do the SF paracords as well, again, with the counterparts. So it's, it's a slightly different course, um, um, but it's, 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 it's all centered around what the role of 264 is, and that is close communication support for 22 SAS. Mm. Um, you know, my time in the squadron was exciting. Um, I spent six months on the uh, special projects team, which is the UK counterterrorism team. Um, you know, I, I was working alongside Billy Billingham, um, which we all know now is part of the SS program. Um, and yeah, even though our job is 264, um, we are assigned a troop, um, which is designated as part of the Sabre squadron for 22 SAS. Um, so yeah, in, in, in certain operations, we'll work alongside them. We could be um, forward with them, providing communications, and sometimes at the rear, providing communications as well. So the job is varied and it depends on your, your own skill set and your, your time served depending on where you'll be used in that front. And you're sometimes used as an individual as well, not just a, a troop. Uh, so you could be attached to a different squadron for certain roles. So it's quite varied. Now, when I, when I joined up, I wasn't interested initially in World Signals. I was interested in joining the Paris. I um, went to Sutton Coalfield, did all and passed all the, the tests initially. Uh, to join the Paris but my dad actually taught me out of doing that my dad was an ex-tanky he taught me out of that and said no you want to get a trade behind you son you want to get a trade behind you um I, I, I listened to him and that's exactly what I did I asked could I go for it the tests were quite hard actually to get in the suit um but I did I managed to do it and that's the path I went however there's only so much you can do and you, you know for my for myself I'm really adventurous person I was based at York 
I did all my comms training there. I was actually working alongside the, the now Dame Kelly Holmes, who was um, a PTI in the gym when I, when I was in York based there. I got bored of the normal rigmarole of the job, so I wanted to be a physical training instructor as well. So I did that and I was working with Kelly in, in, the, uh, in the gym. Um, I got bored of that after a while as well. Wanted something, wanted some excitement. And someone, you know, uh, uh, pointed me towards a training officer. Um, it, it was in the regiment, X264, and then went regiment. Uh, it was based, it would come back to York and it was based there. No one knew, apart from a few guys, pointed me towards him and he said, yeah, you want a bit of adventure? Come with me, he signed me up. And before I know it, I'm on selection with 264. Uh, and that's what, you know, that's where it all come from. But yeah, my feet didn't hit the ground though. As soon as I went there, I was abseiling out the Puma Heli um, on the, in, you know, in Hereford. And um, I thought, yeah, I've made it here. But then the, the coin, the coin dropped because you do realize your job is comms. And then you start doing a lot of the comms training, some of that's boring. A lot of guys that join 264 don't actually join for the comms. They join for the buzz and the environment that you're in. And I was, I was one of them. So yeah, I did the comms bit, but I was there for the excitement and the buzz for everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it was a great, great time, great experience. So you had to do the Special Forces parachute course? Yeah. How was that? Um, it, <laughs> Again, I'd never jumped out of a plane before that, um, and I'll confess straight away, I was pretty scared of heights. Um, what was worse for me is I wasn't a great swimmer at the time. I was just as scared of water as I was of heights. Um, and part of the selection process known as probation at the time uh, for 264, part of that is in the aquatic centre in Hereford, jumping off the top. Uh, into in from darkness you, you don't know how high up you are you don't know where the water level is you just have to jump off, off this platform and I just remember counting to about five before I hit the water um, and I almost passed out because I hit the water that hard and then when you're under the water it's pitch black and the only way I knew which way was up by blowing bubbles in the water and and then eventually I got to the top it, it was the most nerve-wracking no, you had to you had to do that in order to then go on to um, to qualify for your para course. A lot of guys failed that point because they wouldn't step off. And their argument is, if you don't step off that confidence test, you will not jump out of a C one hundred and thirty. And that that was their argument. Um, luckily, I did. I had to do it twice though, and I think that's because I was the first one. I think first or second to jump off the platform, um, and they needed to fulfil the time. So I ended up having to go and do it again, which wasn't great. I, I sweated for nights thinking about that coming up because, as I say, heights weren't my thing. Neither was water. So jumping from a height into water wasn't the best of days for me. Um, but, yeah, it, it, I went from there, did the para course. I had to do, I think it was nine jumps um, to get my wings. My first two jumps was from a balloon. Um, uh, they don't do that anymore. In fact, we were the last stick to actually go up in that balloon, that winch balloon which uh, is very old and yeah, they scratched it after, after our uh, day at West, Western on the Green, that used to be. Um, so you go up 800 foot and then you jump out of this little box that's hanging from, hang, hanging from the balloon. Um, the reason why, it's, why it's, um, it was so scary is because it was only 800 feet. So when you're in an aircraft, things don't look real and you don't get that sense. But from, an, from, an, from a, a balloon where you can still make people out, and it's stationary as well. So when you jump, you jump for, you, you fall for quite some time before your chute will open. And, and you do get that feeling of, you know, <laughs> stomach in your mouth kind of thing. So yeah, they were my first two jumps and the rest of them were um, from the C-130, from the side doors on the rear. So did yeah, good, to, good time. Did you have to do the skydiving part? The head? Um, no, we, well, some guys did. What they do now with 264 is, um, Everyone, well, not everyone, some guys do the halo. Um, back in the day when I was doing it, that was not included. They've changed it now. So, guys, they have to have a capability from the squadron, the halo jumps. Um, so, then guys are then selected if there's any ops or exercises that involve that. Um, in the 90s, when I did my course, that wasn't in existence then. So, we didn't do that. I personally and, and the guys I was with didn't do the, didn't do the halo. So, all our jumps were static line. Um, which, yeah, 
um, you know, he obviously put a lot of faith in that line <laughs> that you can't feel as attached to him. So, yeah, um, jumping out with the C-130 out the side door um, is a completely different um, sensation than jumping out of the rear door, which just felt like a long slide you were jumping from. But, yeah, good, good fun. Mm. What year were you at Bryce? Um, I was there in 94. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, the thing you described about jumping off the diving board in the pitch black, mm. which probably, I'm, I'm guessing most people would opt for that over the Hercules. Yeah. And, and yet, what, what, the way you describe it scared the hell out of me. Whereas jumping out of Hercules is quite easy. I think, I think as well. I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't easy. Every, everyone's, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. If you say you, you, know, you haven't got that sense of fear, like you said, it's built into us in our fight and flight uh, reflex. Um, if you haven't got a sense of fear, you're lying or you're not human. <laughs> Every, it doesn't matter how many jumps you do. You've got to have that. It's a self-defense mechanism. And, and, and I say that to everyone, don't try and get over that. That's what keeps you alive and what will keep you alive. So when I'm sat there and I am nervous as hell, it's funny because we had a lot of young paras on the same, on the same course. And they were singing all the airborne songs in, in the hangars and all bravado. When he got on the plane, them songs went to whistles. Uh, <laughs> and it, you know, hums and whistles. So, yeah, you could see they were trying to stick to the bravado, but the experience wasn't there. So they were, yeah, very nervous. But I was a little bit older, and, and there was one guy next to me, and that's what we were talking about. Yeah, we're nervous, but let's, let's suck it up and just, this is a job. And I treated it as a bit of transport from getting from A to B, and that's how I looked at it. Um, and it's something we had to do. It's not something I would take up as a hobby. Um, it's not my thing. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a job. But it was fun. Looking back, it was fun, and that's how you know, how I remember it. Mm -hmm. Without um, compromising yourself or, or obviously the, <laughs> the regiment or, or your squadron, um, what, what kind of deployments did you get? Um, well, we had, when I first hit um, my troop, um, then I was assigned into B squadron um, uh, as, as a signaller. And my first exercise I went on was in Norway. So we did, it was a, a rotation that all the guys do. Um, and yeah, it was far north of Norway. Um, so it's a training area and we were there for a month and yeah, it was a winter survival kind of uh, exercise, which is routine for the guys. I learned a lot. I got really close to the B squadron guys at that point and learned quite a lot. Um, you know, 264, it's one of them kind of squadrons. You can take a back seat if you want in these training scenarios or you can be up there and you can learn a hell of a lot and I, I was I was the latter I wanted to you know that's what I was there for as I said I wasn't you know my even though my job was comms I, I didn't join 264 for comms I, I would have stayed in the green army for that I wanted to be part of that action uh, and, and get that thrill so yeah I took I took um, I took a lot of pride in in you know um, in taking part in a lot of the, what the guys were doing as well so yeah, that was my first experience um, of, of being out and about with the guys. First operational, um, yeah, I was out in, in, in theatre where, um, you know, keeping the places nameless, I, I was out in theatre and we were operating in small, small patrols. Uh, so I was part of a, a very small uh, patrol, um, a Sabre Squadron patrol, and yeah, it was intelligence gathering at the time in that, in, in that particular theatre. Um, my job again primarily was comms, um, but because of that job, I was quite important. And it's great when you know you are a vital asset to, to a team, and um, because without that communication support, that team's nothing. Um, as, as, as much and as great as the individual guys are, and they, they all share, share their trade and what they do, they all need they all do need comms. And I felt like I was part of, of that team. Um, you know, I was living, shitting, breathing everything with them day in day out um in 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 the small um uh, place that we occupied and similar tr similar patrols were all over the area so yeah we um we had to get along and we had to get on with each other and do the job um, and i was there for quite a long time uh, eight months in total 
um, with only a short break home. So yeah, um, if you didn't get on with someone, then that's a long time to be spent in a hostile environment mm-hmm. when, you're, when you're stuck in close proximity to other people. You I got a lot out of that. I got a lot out of it as well, so it was great. You just reminded me, Jace, that um, I actually have the, I've had the honour of going on patrol with the SAS. Um, yes, in Northern Ireland, this is in- interesting. I've got to be careful what I say here, but we had um, two troopers attached to my, uh, my brick. So that's my four, four man team. We had, so we went out as a six with these two SAS guys. And uh, all I'm saying is six of us went out of that camp. Only four came back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and here's the funny thing, or the interesting thing is, they didn't tell us when they were going to leave us. So it was a case of. <laughs> Where do they go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Very yeah. a whole. I mean, we, you know, we, we're brave. We were brave in the Marines. Undoubtedly. Mm. These, what some of the things these guys got up to just took, took, it just took living life to the extreme to a whole level, right? Yeah. I'll give you another slight example. There was an observation post. I won't say where it was, but my guys were in there, uh, uh, as in my fellow, fellow Marines, and the IRA decided to open up on it with a machine gun. So the equivalent of our GPMG, I'm, I don't know what the machine gun was. And uh, the, the, the rounds are hitting the bulletproof glass of this observation post. Yeah. And this is the way my mate told me, so forgive, just, I'll just tell it how it is. Yeah. The Marines hit the floor, and they're scrabbling over the floor to get to the radio to you know, re- give a contact report. And my mate said these two SAS guys just calmly kicked open a bulletproof window, and they're just... <laughs> Just engaged in a, you know, a fi- firefight with the, um, these two IRA players in in, in yeah. the street. So, yes, yeah, different, almost like a different level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's um, that's the thing with with the squadron as well with two six four. Um, it was so varied because you, even though I was um, aligned with B squadron, I was I was in B troops, so I was aligned with B squadron. It's like I was saying before, you, you're not always working with, with your squadron. You can be assigned to another squadron, which I was in that theatre I was talk, talking about. So it was even more challenging because I didn't really know the guys when I was embedded with them uh, into that area. And I soon got to know them and they got to know me. And you have, you have to work with them. You go through that hardship and you have to work with them. But, you know, we, we were there to do a job. And it was, it was a difficult job and challenging times, you know. And I look back in that with... With, with some pride um, but yeah you know I've worked with some with, with some really good guys from that unit um, 264 has changed totally in the way that it recruits now as well it used to only recruit from a, a Royal Signals background but now it recruits from all across the British Army um, and, and Royal Marines as well it recruits from Royal Marines so guys on 264 selection now come from all like like the regiment itself they come from all the variants of all the armed forces so you know when you're uh, out on operations you just like the regiment itself you've got a breadth of uh, experience with you from all different backgrounds and they they're ambassadors of their units as well um and, and that's what makes a, a good patrol you know they're all from different mm-hmm. different units and, and make up that patrol so it's, it's it's interesting and exciting to work in that kind of environment what kind of hairy times did you have? Um, there was a time when um, we was, again, with, trying to keep as vague as possible here, we were occupying um, a, a house at the time. Um, we all had our personal weapons. I was actually in, in my area, in my room, and I was cleaning. I was what cleaning. Um, we had the Marcos and, and different variants of the M16. Um, so. Uh, DeMarco's, um, we had um, Sig Sar, um, secondary hand, hand, 
pistols as well. Mm. Um, so at the time, I was playing around with my lens of, 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 uh, the, of the DeMarco, and I was looking outside to focus, and um, a, a group of, of guys opened up on, on near, near our house. Um, and it was quickly dealt with. Let's let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, that was a that was a, a hair. You know, that was one of my first experiences of a, of a contact. Um, you know, and I, I I flew back in in, in the room. Um, yeah, I think I, you know, to be honest, I had to check my body. Have I just been shot? Um, it, it was you know it was AK forty seven rounds that were coming inbound. So um, yeah, that was quite hairy. That was out there. That blooming Mister Kalashnikov. <laughs> He's yeah. got a lot to answer for, hasn't he? Really? Yeah. <laughs> luckily, luckily, um, the people, the, the guys behind that were not were not at the same caliber of what was behind me. So, <laughs> so we were quite lucky there. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a it was a volatile kind of environment at the time. And, and the thing is, as well, because my my job was comms. My primary job was comms. I had, to, you know, we were told. Um, through and I, I saw this because I had to relay it. Um, we were told through the communications that there was no sniper uh, positions in the area, and yet <laughs> here I was stood on a, a roof of a building trying to erect an antenna, knowing there's a sniper in distance of me. And I kept having to try and move like that so he couldn't, you know, hypothetically, so no one could, you know, get a good fix on me. So it, it, it just become part of the job. and looking back now there was a lot of risks being took by you know not just the guys but you know for, for everyone especially for the comms guys like i say that had to site and propagate these these uh, antennas and get you know get things working in the middle of a hostile environment like that. that's all part of the job and that's that's what you join a squadron like that for how um again obviously we're not going to give specifics away but has the technology come forward in in leaps and bounds yeah, huge, hugely. I mean, when I, I, I was serving in the 90s, now I've kept my foot in the door by means of keeping in contact with colleagues who have not long left. And from, from everything, from tracking to surveillance to communications, just like in, on the commercial side, um, in Civvy Street, you know, things have come on leaps and bounds since the 90s. Um, communications has come on hugely. I mean, we were using old 319 HF radios to communicate uh, back to the UK. Um, uh, that, that's just relics now, you know, and I'm only talking, you know, you know, it's 20 years. But when you, when you really think about how things have moved on, they're, they're classed as relics and they probably are in museums, literally, these, these radio kits we were using and having to deal with. Saying that, that's, that's what the, that's what the um, you know, we had a, a, a large American base just down the road from where we were. Um, and yeah, Beg Borough Steel, we were using a lot of their kit, which was, you know, great. I'm sure things have changed a lot now, um, but I used to go down there with things that I knew they liked um, and we would swap. They, they, even though we loved their, MR, we loved their MREs, they loved our rations. Uh, and I don't know, I really to this day don't know why. So we used to go down and trade some things and what I got from them is some great comms kit. Um, on loan, of course, but they had absolute shitloads of it. So we, we, I used to take that, uh, get a few brownie points off the lads because all of a sudden, yeah, they're getting comms where they need to get comms and they can chat and you know to people they haven't been able to talk to before and things like that. So it, yeah, it's it, it was knowing it's getting getting to know the environment and the people around you that you're working with as well helps. As they say, hearts and minds. It's it's a great player in any environment like that. Mm -hmm even when it's your own uh, allies, so yeah. <laughs> so, Jason, let, to, to close, I'm, I'm interested in hearing some happy kind of results of your SF experience, as in your, the fan dance you run. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing people rock up there for all different kind of reasons, but I'm guessing some really are there to kind of challenge themselves from a sort of a deeper perspective um per you know all lots of different personal reasons i'm guessing some have been through bereavement 
some maybe have, have had low self-esteem in the past so can you tell us some of your success stories yeah um we we as i say we do get i get personally i get a lot of emails and requests and people who we have we are, have also got um what we call a members rv group on facebook uh, a rendezvous uh, group where i allow people who've took part in our events to join this group um there's over 2000 members inside and it's just like one big family and i have created it in that way and so have the people that work around me so that people can talk amongst like-minded people and share their stories share um what they you know any tough times they've gone through i think i'm a big believer in when you've got something to aim for especially if it's some physical because physical exercise in itself helps to um, stem negativity in, in our brains. So, I'm a, you know, I'm a big believer. I, I suffered with anxiety myself years ago and I come through it with self-help. So I can, I can deliver a lot. In fact, I do deliver uh, what's known as, I've called it reboot. And I help people uh, personally um, who are suffering with depression, anxiety. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I'm someone that's been through it. And there's nothing I don't know that I can, that I can speak about on, on the subject. Um, and I do it through, I focus on the training aspect and also on education. I let people know the science behind how it affects us as humans uh, and what you can do to combat that. And it's all about being positive, having an aim. And 99.9% .9 of people love what we do and, and love the success of what we're doing. And we, you know, I've helped a lot of people out that are on a personal journey through the events. Um, we like to give discounts on events for people who are, you know, want to take part or financially struggle to take part. I follow people's personal journeys as well and see how we can help and involve their personal journeys. Um, and I, I look at new ideas through our team. It's not just me personally. We've got a good team around us as well. Um, and we look at ways, different ways we can help people's personal journey because that's what we're about. We call the SF experience. We want to deliver a special forces environment, but for positive, you know, for positive reasons, take all the positive out of what that is and deliver it to people. You don't have to be special forces to take part. You, you, everyday people can come and have a go um, and, and, and tr test themselves. And off the back of that, as I say, we get emails um, and people start opening up and saying, well, I've, you know, this has happened to me in my life. Uh, you know, this is why I'm doing it. And I can, I can, I, I love, I love the fact that I've, I'm in a position I can help them. It's some of them are, are, are tragic. Some of them, um, my ears stick on the back of my neck because I can relate totally. And that's why I feel I can help. And that's why one of the reasons that spurs me on to do it. And that's genuinely because I want to, you know, push people forward when they want to, when they need that bit of, you know, bit of help. You're doing a, a cracking job, mate. Absolutely smashing. Just stick with what you're doing. Uh, I'd just like to give a shout out here to Naz Hussein QC, who put us in touch with each other. Yeah. And it, that just goes through what you're saying. If you put positive stuff out to the universe and you're, you know, and you're nice to people, it just comes, comes back, yeah. mate, doesn't it? It just comes. I, I agree. I agree. The, the very fact that Naz got in touch with me was through the events. And what a great guy. And his son, Sal, as well. What a great guy. What a great youth. You yeah. know, he's, he's only 14 and he's looking at his career. Um, and that attracted me. That, that just attracted me to look at what he was doing. We're trying to help him best we can. We've got, we're looking at doing a youth program ourselves uh, to help the likes of Sal. Because I know what that's like when I was 14. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was walking home with one of my friends, walking his girlfriend home and stood there thinking, what am I doing? You know, I, I, I've come to a situation where I thought, I've got to do something here. Um, I was always into the army anyway. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to join the army. And I'm glad I did. When I look back, um, you know, it's... I did not know what I wanted to do at that age. Your hormones are changing and everything. So I look at people like young Sal, and I think he's got his head screwed on. He wants, he knows what he wants. 
facing in the right direction kind of thing that and, and help him in that in, in that respect and um, I know Naz obviously is is doing what he can and that's it's inspiring to see people like that and if I can help in any way using what I do now then I'm definitely going to help people like Naz and, and Sal. Well you are yeah and you are doing Jason so thank you very much thank you for coming on the podcast and, and telling us all about it I will up on the hills at some point um that's you know i've got to do this thing now you've so you've so you've so you're, 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 <laughs> you're stuck now i've got you know you're you're ours <laughs> yeah the closer you get to you know old age i don't know when you become old i don't think you ever do actually but but what people perceive as old age i think the more you know yeah dark skydiving when you're 70 is what i say yeah, you, I'm totally, totally with you. I'm totally with you. So, um, just Jason, just stay on the line while I say goodbye. So, thank you ever so much again to our yep. friends at home. The details for the SF experience will all be below the video. Thank you ever so much for watching another ed edition of the Bought the T shirt podcast. Big love to you all. See you soon. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.